A very warm welcome to our guest, Professor Peter Katzenstein, the water carpenter professor of international studies at Cornell University in the US. We are delighted to have you with us today. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, if I could take you to the beginning, uh, you have just completed a very impressive project on civilizations in world politics. So I wonder if you could tell us a bit about the intellectual origins of this project. Um, why civilizations, particularly given that it's a difficult, in some ways, almost tainted concept? Well, civilization, because uh, when I teach my freshman uh, introductory class, the most favored reading is Huntington's Clash of Civilization. And uh, while the name civilization sounds musty and is not liked by people in cultural studies and postmodernists, uh, it does turn out that most people who are not academics use the term quite frequently. Even in Ottawa I learned that you have a museum of civilizations. So. Um, and the final volume is entitled Anglo-America and its discontents. Yeah, so there are three volumes, you know, the first one is dealing with the conceptual issues of how does one think about civilizations. The second one deals with sinicization and the rise of China, which is really an analysis of civilizational processes. And the third one does deal with Anglo-America and its discontent, and I do like the title. Um, well, sticking to that title, um, in some ways I suspect it's a deeply personal project because you live, you have long lived at the heart of Anglo-America. You've long been familiar with key features, but also some of its internal tensions. Well, was there anything new, anything particularly surprising that yeah, you discovered? Yeah, I mean, it, it has deep autobiographical roots. Uh, I was saved by Anglo-America. Uh, I wasn't saved by Germans. Uh, I was saved by American soldiers from Hitler and fascism. And, uh, so I've embraced Anglo-America in my lifetime. I came to America when I was 18. Uh, uh, America has treated me well. Uh, I've learned about America. and. I've come to think hard about it, and this project is a way of coming to terms particularly with the issue of race. And this was something new, something that you discovered in the process of working yeah. on this project? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've stayed away from contentious issues like um, the Holocaust and race. I think this is for a German born after the Second World War. These are difficult issues. I'm somewhat older now. so it was time to fess up to it. Mm. Well, the book refers to Islam and Anglo-America as being two bridging civilizations. You say that in different ways they both bridge East and West. And that concept of the bridge is a fascinating one. But I wonder how far we can push it. How does this process of bridging occur? And if we do talk about East and West as being bridged by Islam and Anglo-America, isn't there a danger that in portraying it that way, we might inadvertently reinforce precisely the kinds of images that this volume seeks to transcend, the image of the East being coherent and distinct from the West, and therefore in need of a bridge. Yeah, maybe. I mean, the subtitles of volume two and three are beyond East and West, so I think I don't regard that risk as very large because the message of the project is very, very clear. Uh, I think the more interesting question is, well, if you're on the bridge, will you ever arrive someplace? And um, I don't think so. I think you just walk on the bridge. Uh, so the notion that, you know, you reach the other shore, you know, it's a bridge leading nowhere. It is a bridge leading nowhere. It's just you're on the bridge and you're walking and uh, the contours change and you don't know where it's leading. Right? So, and that image, I think, is quite disconcerting. Uh, mm -hmm particularly to my liberal friends in America who think that liberalism is in fact the truth, right? And uh, I think that's a conceit of liberals. Uh, liberalism has a lot of value and valuable aspects to it. But the notion that liberalism has the truth and that it is upon liberals uh, to convince the rest of the world of that truth and you do it in English and you talk slowly in a loud voice hasn't worked for 200 years. It won't work for the next 200 years either. So. Well, speaking of liberalism, uh, what are the implications of this civilizational turn for IR theory debates in general? 
Well, I think the main advantage is, if you think about the core concepts of which international relations scholars think about the world, it's either the international system, which is a very abstract concept, uh, or it's global or international politics. And uh, both of those terms really don't contextualize the system of meanings and values in which much of politics occurs. So civilizational analysis in this sense would be a better specification of the context of politics. It's not a substitute for political analysis. I mean, one of the major flaws in Huntington's analysis is to regard civilizations as actors. This is a big mistake. Uh, civilizations are a context in which actors choose. Yeah. You spoke earlier about the question of destinations. And in this volume, you talk about the movement to polymorphic globalism. Uh, I wonder if you could please explain this concept and specifically identify its relationship to liberalism. So there was this amazing book written by William McNeill, who was the first historian of global history, uh, The Rise of the West, uh, which was published in the 1960s. And many people think this is one of the great books of the historian profession in the last 50 years. And certainly it was sort of the first coming of global history. And he rewrote the book in the form of a self-critical book review uh, in 1990, in which he said, well, it's a very good book, but I forgot one big thing, uh, which is to say that the world consists out of a large encompassing context in which the West and Islam and China and India and other civilizations are lodged. Uh, so then the question is, how do we think about that larger context? And the scholars who have thought most about it are, in fact, Islamic scholars, uh, because they deal with a civilization which really spans from Senegal to Indonesia. Uh, and, and what I've come up with is, in fact, the, what I call polymorphic globalism is um, conceptualization of a context as a set of processes, two in particular, human rights and human well-being, which are no longer contained by any single civilization or polity or empire or state. That is, they have distended themselves from the conventional centers of political power and authority. So now, if you are in China, or if you are in Africa, or if you are in Latin America, or Europe, or the United States, you can no longer retain legitimacy and authority uh, unless you invoke and defer to human rights and human well-being. So that is, in a sense, the, the global context is made out of a politics and a set of practices and norms which are beyond all conventionally conceived political authorities. This project is completed. Um, can we ask what's next on your agenda? No project is ever completed. So every book <laughs> raises a new question. So this. The trilogy is completed, but uh, I myself do want to write on polymorphic uh, globalism and put this together with uh, chapters which I've written here into a book on civilizations, which would be complementing and adding to what I've done. But the other area is to write on America as a civilization, because I think that uh, the debate of the last 10 years, ongoing debate in America, actually is mistaking the strength of America particularly what Joe and I calls it soft power. So that is something which I like to think about more. Well, certainly look forward to that. And if I could finally invite you to imagine that we have a room full of MA and PhD students who are just starting their studies and are wondering what to focus on. They're wondering what the next big debate in IR might be, what the next big issue might be. What would you say? I haven't a clue. Uh, I've gone out of the prediction business a long time ago. Uh, I'm in the world of ideas and you should study what you find interesting. Thank you very much indeed. I really appreciate it.